art and cultures around the world. And of course, you all know I love to travel. So here, uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about is for 16 years, I taught art at Fernbank Elementary School. And I focused on both the works of fine artists and also folk art and craft from around the world. So I'm going to show you a few things that my kids did, which um, relate to the museum we're going to visit. Weaving, an all-time favorite. This is called uh, Ojo de Dios, which means God's eye. And it's a spiritual object made by weaving a design in a circular manner. Um, these are very common in the pueblos of New Mexico. Some believers think that the spiritual eye, the Ojo de Dios, has the power to see and understand things that the physical eye cannot. Here are uh, more weavings we did. That's actually my grandson when he was a little boy right there on the left. And um, this is weaving as one of the oldest traditions in the world. And since 2500 BCE, it's been important in the Peruvian culture. And these are pouches that the kids would keep their recorders in for their music performance. Another project I enjoyed, um, I would make an annual trip to the farmer's market and I would buy lots and lots of beans. And this is called seed or crop art. And um, with these beans, we would create uh, different mosaic style artwork. And mosaic is basically a technique where you glue small objects onto a backing. Another craft that we taught was calligraphy. It's basically uh, means beautiful handwriting. This is Arabic calligraphy. I wanted to teach my kids uh, something about an alphabet that wasn't that they weren't familiar with. So we looked at the Kufic alphabet and I taught them how to write their names. And then with the name design, they carved this design into the linoleum blocks and we printed them in lot colors. Another craft that we enjoyed is this foil embossing from Mexico. So um, this was a project that um, got us involved with the ancient Aztec symbols and Mexican decorative designs. Students would press their designs into the foil and then they would color them in with Sharpies. And I asked them to choose symbols that uh, represented their characters and personality traits. And this will look familiar to most of you. Here we are, uh, here I am at uh, Fernbank doing paper mache with my fifth grade students. Um, paper mache has been a popular craft technique for centuries. It was uh, originated in China where actually paper itself was invented. <clears throat> and going back to like the Han dynasty, uh, they used to make helmets out of paper mache. <clears throat> But the kids loved this was a, one of their favorite projects. And we were making imaginary animals. And here you have some examples of uh, some imaginary animals. <clears throat> Excuse me. Another craft was uh, embroidery, Chinese embroidery. And uh, this is an art or craft of decorating fabric or other materials with needle and thread. Uh, it originated in China and the Near East. And here my students selected an ancient Chinese design and learned to stitch it onto burlap using the back stitch. Now, surprisingly enough, the boys just absolutely couldn't get enough of this project. All right, now we jump into the art room at, uh, at the center. Um, so after uh, 16 years, after I retired from teaching at Fern Bank, Victoria asked me, would I consider teaching at the center? And I said, yes, I would. So here we are. Uh, working on uh, in mosaic um, glass. And there's uh, Steve, I'm gonna jump back and actually go back to the paper mache project. But if anyone knows Steve, his absolute favorite thing of all times uh, are lobsters. So he made this wonderful paper mache lobster and actually said to me, this was farm to table. And then he painted it blue, but a great project. Here are two more students working on their animals in paper mache. <clears throat> and a few more that you probably remember. The one on the top right is pattern after the artist Romero Brito, who uses lots of bright colors and uh, patterns. And the bowl, we used 
a cow themed tissue paper to decorate that bowl. And of course, on the bottom right, we have uh, Judy Knight's wonderful circus elephant. And the project would not be complete without Rohini's cow, which was uh, made a huge splash at the center. And there we have Betty with her beautiful paper mache plate that uh, she was decorating for uh, to embellish her bathroom at the time. And another um, wonderful mask, paper mache mask that uh, contained feathers and jewels and beads. And then we jump into mosaic. The top left mosaic is by Steve Shear, and the one on the right is one that I did. And mosaic, again, for those of you that don't know, is a pattern or image made of pieces of glass or stone, and they're held in place by a mortar or grout. Many years ago, and even today, these are used on floors and walls, and they were very popular in ancient Rome. This one I love, this was a, a actually trays. Many of us made uh, mosaic trays with um, translucent glass. And then the bird houses arrived. So uh, a lot of people enjoyed taking these bird houses and painting them and then applying not just glass, but you can see pieces of uh, broken pottery. And the one on the, the right is a stepping stone, again, with a combination of pottery pieces and glass. And more trays, more bird houses. These were a big hit in the art show at, uh, at the center as well. And then at home during the pandemic, I got into making mosaics with uh, uh, portraits of dogs. So I have since done every dog uh, in our extended family, and uh, I've enjoyed that a lot. After that, uh, we jumped into encaustic wax, and uh, encaustic uh, collage uh, uses hot wax and resin, and you basically apply a layer of uh, hot wax onto a board, um, then you lay down your papers, and you use a heat gun to fuse it. <clears throat> and when you fuse it, <clears throat> excuse me, the layers of wax uh, melt into each other and hold on to the papers. This was a art, an art technique that goes back to ancient Greece and Egypt as early as 100 AD. So um, you can see that all these techniques have a place in art history. There's John Davis with his beautiful artwork. At the beginning of the pandemic, I believe it was Rebecca made this one and we all uh, kind of giggled about it, but it became quite a serious thing more absolutely beautiful uh, nature collages in which we use not just papers, but also uh, feathers and leaves and things of that sort. And here's one that's uh, patterned after Matisse. And then we also got into using photographs. So these are two really beautiful photographs. Okay, so the third reason that I love this museum is because I like to travel and the museum has lots and lots of international art. Uh, this is just a picture from our trip to Nova Scotia at Peggy's Cove. And one of the reasons I love to travel is because of my husband, George Brown. And uh, when he retired from his uh, career with the Friendship Force, he decided to start a travel company, GTB Travel, and together we've taken people actually all over the world. Well, one of the places we went was Santa Fe. We took 35 members from the senior center. Victoria joined us and we went on an American heritage journey. We stayed at a, one of my all time favorite hotels, the Inn of the Governors. And this is an authentic Southwest style hotel right in the heart of downtown Santa Fe. Here you're looking at the exterior bar, um, balconies, which were just full of beautiful flowers. And the hotel's decorated in a traditional New Mexico style with lots of colorful hangings and furnishings. And best of all, which Victoria really enjoyed, <laughs> was that every day we had complimentary tea and sherry and bizcochitos. And that's actually Mexico state cookie but we had a lot of fun conversations in this space. The rooms were a work of art. 
They had exposed beams. They had weavings from Chimayo where we visited and they had adobe fireplaces. This was my room and I barely could even um, believe my eyes because the weavings were just so spectacular. Another view of the room. And in the bathroom even, they had something called Talavera tiles. And these are 100% handcrafted, hand glazed and hand painted tiles. And their origins actually go all the way back to the 17th century in Mexico when the arrival of this, with the arrival of the Spaniards uh, who introduced this new method of making tiles. Uh, they're from the town of Talavera in Spain. And um, they had this beautiful image of the hummingbird. And the hummingbird is a symbol of strength in the Aztec uh, culture because it is said to have guided um, the Aztecs migration to the Valley of Mexico. So it's a symbol of strength and a symbol of follow your dreams. Another thing in the rooms um, were the beautiful works of tin. Um, on the left here, this is a, um, this was in the bathroom. It was a tin frame with the patron saint of animals. So I took a picture of that because I wanted to find out more about it. On the right is the mirror in the room. So there was a little card on the counter and they said that all the tin work had been made by Fred Lopez, the tin man, and they had a phone number. So I called Fred and told him how much I loved his work and asked could we bring our group to visit his studio. And his studio was actually just across the street from the hotel. So we arranged to visit him in uh, a teeny tiny space, but crammed full of his beautiful hammered tin. So um, Fred has been in, at the time had been in his job for making tin for almost 15 years. Um, he has quite a lot of work in the Museum of International Folk and he's been exhibited all over the world. He was a lovely man. Okay, I can't tell about all the places we went to, but I'm just gonna tell about a few. Um, this is one of the first chapels we went to, the San Miguel Chapel. It is the oldest church structure in the United States um, with the exception of Puerto Rico. And it was actually built in 1610. It had to be rebuilt two times. And the last time was 1710. So when we went into this old Adobe style church, which was a mission church, um, it was from the original 1710 building. Inside, we found these all uh, adobe structures. And um, I was fascinated by these little teeny silver um, coin-like um, charms. They are called milagros. And milagros in Spanish means miracles. Each one of these represents a wish or a prayer. They're said to bring good luck, happiness, or prosperity to those who believe in them. So for instance, if you look closely, you can see animals and hearts. You can see body parts. So um, for instance, here's an arm. So suppose you broke your arm. Let's hope that didn't happen. But um, you could then put that little charm up, say a prayer, and hope for better health. One place we visited that's memorable was the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum. And this museum is a tribute to Georgia O'Keeffe's achievements and her continued legacy. Her story is presented in nine galleries inside and it spans the 20th century all the way up to the American modernism. It has her drawings, paintings, pastels, watercolors, and it really was just so special to see all of it in one place. This lovely painting was on display. Even had a room full of all of her um, tools that she used, her tools and her uh, charcoal, her oil pastels. And that was kind of fun to know you were looking at the exact things that she used for her paintings. We also got to see the Palace of the Governors, which is a long adobe structure that was originally the seat of the government for the state of New Mexico. What we enjoyed was our visit to all the artisans. So this is um, the artisans, they spread out here and they sell all their handwares under this uh, portal. And these um, artisans are actually part of a Native American artisans program. Their handcrafted items include pottery, textile, jewelry, 
And uh, many of them are made with traditional turquoise, coral, and silver. And the members um, are vetted and they're actually uh, members of 23 federally recognized Native American tribes, pueblos, and nations in New Mexico. We had the, also the chance to visit the Taos Pueblo. It's actually the oldest continually inhabited dwelling in New Mexico, built back in 1300. And it's a living Native American community today. It's multi-storied and it's been around for over a thousand years. Now, it didn't look like that for us. When we were there, it was rainy and foggy and crowded, not cloudy, um, but we did have a lovely tour. And Victoria insisted that we try the fry bread. Um, fry bread is kind of like the Indian uh, culture's soul food. It originally never had its place um, within the Navajo tribes, but once um, the nations and tribes were put into prison camps, um, this became what was called a, and they had to start on a commodity food program. There was a lot of starvation. And so the Navajos came up with this idea to have fry bread. Another stop we made, which was wonderful, was Ortega's weaving shop. This weaving shop goes all the way back to the 1700s when a young man named George Ortega was among a group of settlers who came here from um, the north to the northern Rio Grande Valley. And they settled in Chimayo, and that's where this is. When uh, Ortega arrived, he was actually weaving, but more for survival, for things made for such as uh, clothing, blankets, rugs. But as time passed on, his work became popular and throughout the centuries, he hired more people. And today this is probably one of the largest weaving companies in New Mexico. So we had lots of fun shopping in here. They had uh, blankets, they had bags, um, they had shawls, all kinds of lovely, beautiful things. And in the back, as a young girl who demonstrated for us how the weavings are made in the shop. All right, and lastly, we went to this fabulous rest called the Rancho de Chamayo. And I'm leaving out a lot of things, but I have to have some time for, for the museum. So this was a Pueblo style restaurant that offered uh, New Mexico dishes and beautiful outdoor seating. Here we are um, after a long day in Chamayo enjoying uh, the lovely ambiance of the restaurant. And people come from all over for this food. They have carne adobado, which is kind of a, a stewed um, meat. They come for the enchiladas, the tamales, and the tamales are made by hand at night for hours at a time. And of course, for the margaritas. And they say it's, a, it's as close to home cooking as you can get. Um, but we had to travel about 35 miles north of Santa Fe up a winding road, uh, which was just breathtaking through the cottonwoods and the Indian reservations. All right, so I could keep talking about Santa Fe, but now I want us to move on and take a look at my favorite museum. Museum Hill. This is actually a hill that overlooks Santa Fe, and it is home to about four or five different museums. So once you get there, you can spend days just going from museum to museum. The um, Mexico Museum of Spanish Colonial Art is there, the Museum of Indian Arts, the, Mex the International Folk Art Museum, and the Santa Fe Wheelwright Museum. Here I am with uh, Victoria and we're standing on the plaza with uh, in front of the statue of a Navajo girl holding a lamb with, um, with sheep. And this was sculpture is by a man named Alan Hauser. And he was one of the most renowned Native American painters and sculptors of the 20th century. And of course, this museum is very popular with uh, field trips for kids and uh, schools. Inside, you're gonna find diverse cultures and the largest collection of international folk art in the entire world. So before I talk about the museum, I wanna show you a short video about the man behind the concept of this museum. His name is Alexander Girard. He's one of the leading American designers during the uh, 20th century. Girard's design work was heavily influenced by his 
passion for folk art. So in 1962, he and his wife uh, set up a foundation to uh, manage his collection of over 100,000 pieces of folk art. And then in 1978, he contributed his entire collection to the Museum of International Folk Art. So I'm going to now show you a short video and then we'll come back. Now, an exhibit celebrating the work of a legendary 20th century designer, Alexander Durant. His work fuses sleek modernism with the playfulness of folk art, creating a world of his own. Special correspondent Kathleen McCleary's report is part of Canvas, our ongoing and culture series. Many children invent imaginary friends, but when the late Alexander Gerard was a young boy, he dreamed up an entire country, yeah. says curator so, Laura Addison. Here's a map, here's the Republic of Fife. And this is the earliest work chronologically that he did. And it is a metaphor for everything he did there. At Fantasyland is where the Gerard retrospective at Santa Fe's International Folk Art Museum begins. Gerard drew stamps, forged coins, even concocted a secret language. He created worlds. He was an inventor of spaces and universes. In 1960, that meant shaping the space for a chic New York City restaurant, La Fonda del Sol in the Time Life Building. He designed nearly every aspect of the Latin American eatery. Nothing was too small and nothing was too large tackle. So not only did Alexander Gerard work with the interior space, with the walls and the treatments and the tables and, and, and the larger objects, he also did everything from matchbooks to the tea service, to the match strikes, to the napkins, the waiter's uniforms, the carts. In 1965, an even bigger design makeover for the Dallas-based Braniff Airlines. The new slogan, the end of the plane plane. We hired Alan Gerard to do our plane. We have blue planes, orange planes, yellow planes. You can fly with it seven times and never fly the same color twice. Again, Gerard designed almost everything, including a brand new typeface used on tickets, baggage tags, and even sugar packets. The rebranding that he did in terms of logo, typography, it came through and over 17,000 individual objects. The aim, Gerard said, was to destroy the monotony of air travel. And he did the same for office environments. Alexander Gerard was best known as a textile designer. It was at Herman Miller Furniture in Detroit that Gerard gained his reputation as one of the 20th century's most influential interior and textile designers. There, he worked with Ray and Charles Eames, a married couple known for their sleek modern chairs and tables, often upholstered in Gerard's fabrics. In the 1960s, cubicles were the late office design. Gerard created panels to brighten the sterile workplaces. This is Daisy Face. She's a human figure morphing out of a tree, or perhaps it's the other way around. Uh, you see the branches coming out of her arms and the, as well as her legs. And she has petals around her head, just like a daisy. She's graphically bold, uh, very colorful, and meant to bring joy into your office space. The common spaces, the restaurant, the office environment, how can what's there be considered art? Well, Alexander Gerard liked to say, art is not art if it is not synonymous with living. Uh, to him, it was all about the joy in the making. It was about human creativity. Gerard's creativity was inspired by his passion for folk art, such as the traditional tree of life. Visitors can see the inspiration in a huge permanent exhibit across the hall, says museum director Kristan Biella. We're just steps away from the retrospective, and folk was a very important part of his design practice. Gerard and his wife traveled the world for decades, scooping up folk art. In 1978, they donated more than 100,000 pieces to this museum, giving it the world's largest collection. 10,000 objects are on display, all of them. In Southern Puebla in Mexico. Here too, Gerard's treasures are assembled into miniature worlds. Gerard wanted things like a very large church or a train or a graveyard or 500 cactuses or jail. And so he commissioned this, this entire scene and recreated it here. 
None of the folk art is identified by country, artist, or date, and that's on purpose. He wanted to experience this as he saw it, and labels would be a, a way of interfering with that vision. Um, it's also intended to be a space that surrounds you, you know, almost like an immersive experience of Gerard's vision and of world folk art. 26 years after his death, Gerard continues to inspire designers, like Raul Cabra of Oaxaca, Mexico. It's not synonymous with living. So I wanted you to have a chance to uh, visit with um, Gerard. He's quite an amazing person. So we're gonna go back and uh, now we're gonna actually go into the museum and take a look at some things. Okay, so I understand that you can possibly see my notes here, so I'm sorry for that, but we will just continue. Um, all right, so let's see. Here inside the museum are just display after display of little teeny tiny um, setups of life all around the world. So when you walk around this museum, you feel like you're taking part in cultures around the world. There are wall hangings on the, on the walls and tapestries. There's um, um, on and on different kinds. It's just beautiful. You can see this is a display of the, the tin that we talked about, the hammered tin. More exhibits of um, maquettes. And I need to mention this woman, Florence Bartlett, uh, she was actually a wealthy woman from Chicago, and she began visiting New Mexico back in the 1920s. And she had lived through both world wars and felt like by starting this traditional folk art museum, she could then bring people together that had been separated by war by sharing the cultures around the world and getting people to know one another. So um, she donated 2,500 objects to this museum. All right, so I think we should talk a little bit about what folk art is. Um, it's, it's never completely clear, but um, I'm gonna show you objects in the museum and try to explain it. Well, folk art, it can be decorative or it can be utilitarian. And this uh, paper cut design is from China and this plate on the right is actually uh, from Spain, so decorative or utilitarian. It, folk art can be used for daily, uh, going about our daily lives or for ceremonies. And on the left, we have a, um, a basket, which is a Vietnamese basket made from telephone wire. And on the right, we have a ceremonial mask from Peru. Folk art can be made from handmade elements or recycled ones. And on the left, we have actually a crayon drawing. And this is a, from Texas, 1960. And on the right, we have a chulu, which is um, a typical hat from the Andes that normally would be made from different colored uh, wool from the llama. Uh, but here it's actually made from recycled grocery bags and caution tape. Another artwork on the left. So folk art can be self-taught or it could be formally learned. Some of you may recognize uh, Nellie Mae Rose work on the left. She is a folk artist from Vinings, Georgia. And uh, this is called Red Dog on Expressway. So that's, she's a self-taught artist, folk artist. And on the right, we have a formally taught artist who um, his name is Yoshitoshi. And this is a picture of a samurai who's being showered with cherry petals. Folk art can express song, dance, or poetry. On the left, we have a Peruvian dancing hat. And on the right, we have a painting of gospel music from the US. So folk art also can share traditions. And this is actually a piece, it's a wooden sculpture from Poland. And um, it, representing All Souls Day and uh, the, the holiday of Zaduski. 
where people from all over the world gather to visit the graves of their loved ones. And folk art includes everyone from class, status, gender, ethnicity, and religion. And here are different wooden figures from um, on the left is the US, the second one is Oaxaca. And then we have this, they called it figure of a white boy from Brazil. And on the right, we have a dancing doctor from Peru. Okay, some of the things that I particularly enjoyed when we visited, there was a, a miniature circus exhibit. This is the Morris Miniature Circus. And this is um, just like a big top circus. It was built over 40 years by Wendy Morris from Amarillo, Texas, and it was acquired by the museum in 1984. This was, if you can imagine, a tremendous table that you could walk around. This exhibit contained teeny tiny little figures, just like the big top. It was like a railroad circus back in the day when a circus would come to town, it would set up in a day, perform, and then pack up and move on. And I just must have spent a long time walking around and looking at all the beautifully crafted figures. The museum also is a gorgeous interior. This is the, uh, the, the rec area, the lunchroom area. So if you came with a group, you could have your lunch here. And I thought it was just a lovely festive space. You can also rent the museum for holidays. And uh, this is set up for a wedding. Then I had a kind of interesting thing happen. I was walking through the Japanese section, a um, lot of Japanese ornaments and elements, and I came across something called a fukusasa. This is a branch and attached to it are all kinds of uh, festive coins and good luck charms. When I was a little girl, my dad had been on a business trip to Japan and he came back and he brought me this wand. It was then I think made of maybe plastic, but it had all these coins on it. And for me, it was just magical. And I had no idea that um, of its meaning at the time, but um, later I found out here, you can see one of the branches <clears throat> that it's patterned after a holiday in Japan called Toka Ebisu. And this is a holiday mainly focused um, on the businessmen in Japan. And they can, they come from all over the world uh, to this festival and they buy a branch. And this is supposed to bring them good luck for good business for the year to come. Now, some of you may recognize this quilt. This looks like um, the High Museum a while back had an exhibit of the G's Bin quilt makers quilts. And these are coming from a small town in, Ohio, in Alabama, where these, there were women who were uh, in a rural isolated community and they began quilting mainly for physical needs, for warmth. And uh, they would sit and share and make their quilts together um, and later they were, they were discovered and their quilts were sent all over the United States on exhibit. This is called an improvisational quilt. They called their quilts my way quilts because they would just start quilting and just wherever it took them, uh, they would let it go. So they're just beautiful without a pattern. This piece, I don't know very much about, but I took a picture of it and thought it was pretty amazing. And here's some work. This is beaded uh, work from African, um, from Zimbabwe and South Africa. And a lot of the men uh, in their spare time will build these figures out of wire and then intricately decorate them with beads. And this was uh, popular and, uh, and just beautiful all over the museum. This was a wall hanging and uh, these primitive cats. This reminded me a little bit of the artwork called the Wusho, yarn art. And this is a technique that is um, performed by putting like a waxy glue onto a surface and very tediously pressing yarn into the painting bit by bit till you get these images. And these were visions by the Wusho shamans 
and they would um, use peyote and have these visions where they thought they could communicate with the gods and heal themselves. So uh, they tell their stories through these paintings. Throughout the museum, there was elaborate embroidery. And I love this one because it, uh, when you get up close, you can see how detailed the different stitches are. This was just a fun piece. It's the word love written in many different languages in the shape of a heart. I thought the typography was quite spectacular um, and also uh, spoke to my graphic design background. And then the hammered tin art going back to the Milagros also is, uh, was a favorite of mine. And of course, these whimsical ceramic figures. So thinking about what could the future of the uh, art projects in the center look like? Well, I have an idea for one, and I'd like to show you a very short video so you can see one. It's called a Dinkra cloth. So I'm gonna show that to you now. Uh, to him, it was all about. Oops. Thank you for your patience. Here we go. Adinkra are visual symbols. Adinkra are most often used on fabrics and pottery, but they have also been incorporated into the walls of buildings and on jewelry. Adinkra was created by the Ashanti people, who lived in what is now southern Guyana. These cloths were traditionally worn by royalty and spiritual leaders for funerals and other very special occasions. They are now worn by anyone, stylishly wrapped around women or men on special occasions. In the past, they were hand printed on undyed red, dark brown, or black cotton, depending on the occasion and the wearer's role. The ink for the Adinkra stamping is made from the bark of a body tree. First, the bark is shaved off with a machete. The ink producer soaks the bark in water for one day and then pounds it in order to soften it. The softened bark is then boiled for two more days, producing a thick black ink called Adinkra Aduru, or Adinkra medicine. The symbols are carved onto the bottom piece of a gourd. The ink is then applied with the stamp in a rocking motion on the fabric. These are just a few of the adinkrasing symbols and their meanings. So that's one project I think could be kind of fun. Um, another one, we might think about doing is making molas, which is a, a technique with fabric that is taken from the Kuna Indians in Panama. And another one we might try is what we saw with the Milagros. We might make our own uh, copper repoussé art. So um, I'm gonna come back to you live now. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. I know I've kind of giving you a whirlwind tour of my favorite museum, but uh, uh, thank you for listening. I'd love to hear your reactions. Um, I enjoyed it very much. And you got me thinking of going to Santa Fe. Good, well, I, I'm ready to go back anytime. In fact, um, every summer they have an international folk art market. And um, three days, invited artists from all over the world come and they sell their wares on that Museum Hill Plaza. So I'm ready to go and take a group. Sounds yeah. good. I, my favorite my, uh, also. My daughter is um, getting married um, in, in Spain. Spain. Hopefully, maybe, maybe in September. In September. But her in-laws are in Albuquerque, so we've gone out there and visited with them, and they took us to stay. And we went to the inn, George's Museum, 
Um, we went to the church with the Milagros. It was just wonderful. There, it was a balloon festival back then too, which is, which is spectacular every year. Um, but uh, we did not make it to the folk art museum, but I tried a lot of those things in my classroom as well, Jill, and the weaving was a great hit, especially with the guys. And it's good to see you. Well, good you to see Loretta. <laughs> <laughs> you too, Suzanne, thank you. I just want to say that I went on a trip with George and you. My name is Lucy Carson. And I would commend it to everybody. It was really um, mind boggling. The, the, uh, what people can achieve. It's just, it's it was just beautiful. beautiful. Thank you for taking us. Thank you, Lucy, for coming with us. It was Hi, Lucy. lovely. Hi, Lucy. I have to go. But I thought that was very good, Jill. I really enjoyed it. The photography was really good. I don't know if you took it or George took some of those pictures, but some nice pictures. Thanks, Steve. And um, I didn't ask you for the right to show you that. I hope that was OK. <laughs> I can't wait to get back to your class. I, I know. Yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah. yeah. We, we still have our projects over there waiting for us. I know they've been sitting for a year on the shelves. So I know. <laughs> I said they're slate to do those things and they're still it's sitting there. there. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is I enjoyed some ideas. I enjoyed your class, Jill. It was it's wonderful awesome. to come there. And thank you helped me so much. I don't know how to thank you. Thank you, Loretta. Well, I hear we'll get together soon. All right. Mm. Yeah. Well, thank you, everyone. I don't know how soon, but soon. <laughs> I know. I think uh, Victoria, in all of her newsletters, keeps reminding us that as soon as we can come back, she'll be the first person to let us know. I know so. But I don't know how they're going to deal it with so many people. Well, I think she just mentioned that we're going to have to limit and start with just small groups. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll be the first one to sign up. <laughs> I'll be the second. <laughs> I'll be third. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you all again um, for you, listening. Jill. And uh, let's stay in touch. Yeah. Yeah. Please thank do. Thank you, Jill. Let's say, it's let's great. Have to another see you. one, another project, okay? All right. Yeah. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Good to see you, all of you. Good to see you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye.